Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another AP Daily Practice Session. My name is Carlos Escobar, and I'm coming to you from Miami, Florida. Make sure you download the question that we're going to be working with today. You'll find it in the video description at the bottom of your screen. We're going to be dealing with the FRQ today. We're going to be dealing pre precisely with the poetry section of the FRQ. And I wanted to start with a pre-20th century question. So we're going to be looking at George Gascoigne's poem, For That He Looked Not Upon Her. But I want us to focus, before we look at the actual prompt, I want us to look at the bullet points that you're going to find with every question that you encounter on the AP exam. These are tied to the scoring guidelines. So it's very important, even though I'm not going to review the bullets per se, it's important that you keep this in mind as we work through the question. And these are good reminders that we do need a thesis statement, we need evidence, and with this evidence and that thesis statement, we're going to be building our line of reasoning. And of course, our essay must use appropriate grammar and punctuation throughout the essay. I want you, if you're unclear as to what we mean by a thesis statement or evidence or line of reasoning, which I know is a question that a lot of students sometimes ask about, go into AP Classroom, click on the AP Daily videos for these uh, points, because we guide you through what we mean by these terms. Let's return now to the actual prompt. And I know that whenever you encounter an exam, sometimes you want to delve right into the reading, read the poem, read the prose passage, but I don't think that's the right approach. I think we have to spend some time with the prompt because believe it or not, the writers of the prompt are trying to help you. They're giving you some guidance and it would just be unwise for us not to follow the, the, the pathway that they're developing for us. So there's a few things that are always given to us. We're going to get the title of the work and we're going to get the poet or the writer. Now, you may not know the work. You probably won't know the work and you may not know the writer, but you still want to start thinking particularly about that title for that he looked not upon her. What is that telling us? What is that making us think about? These are some things we're going to ponder before we even read the poem itself. We're also told in this prompt the year in which it was published, 1573. Now, this is going to be a filter through which we're going to process the entire poem. So we're talking about the 16th century, talking about, you know, Shakespearean times, if you will. What do we know about this time period? What do we know about social hierarchy? What do we know about the way that people behaved with one another? What do we know about what people knew about the world, about history, about society? All these things will be informing our reading of the poem. Then we have two very important sections to this prompt. We have the context. This is your best friend. We don't want to enter a reading absolutely cold without knowing what to expect. Even though the title will give us some guidance, this context will give us the, the, the precise, the exact context for the poem. This speaker will explain why he holds his head low. As soon as we are introduced to a speaker, I want you to start thinking about the emotional, about the physical, about the psychological nature of this speaker. And perhaps we can even connect this to the title for that he looked not upon her. And then we're told that he's going to explain why he holds his head low. The speaker is avoiding a stare, avoiding an interaction with this woman. And you're going to start thinking about why that might be the case. Now, we haven't read the poem. We don't have these answers, but we're building questions. We're building filters through which we're going to process the reading of the poem. All of this will add up to our task, which is given at the end of the prompt. We have to write an essay analyzing how Gascoigne uses literary elements and techniques to convey the complex attitude of the speaker. We need to look at this visual because I think oftentimes we read a prompt, we read it quickly, and, and we almost treat it as if it's providing throwaway information. Instead, it should be fodder for thought and for analysis. So the full prompt here is in George Gascoigne's poem, For That He Looked Not Upon Her, 
published in 1573, the speaker explains why he holds his head low. Read the poem carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how Gascoigne uses literary elements and techniques to convey the complex attitude of the speaker. There's two elements here for a task, which is using the literary, literary elements and techniques to explain how the complex attitude is conveyed. In this particular video, as I tackle this prompt, I wanna focus on that complex attitude. In a subsequent video, I'm gonna focus more on the literary elements and techniques. So now you might think, okay, now I'm gonna read the poem, right? Because that is the important thing that we have to do in order to answer this crucial aspect of the prompt. But I'm not. I'm not gonna read the poem at this point. I think there's still some more information we can extract from this prompt sheet before we start reading and before we start writing. The three things that I wanna look at are here. I wanna focus some time on the title. And we did that already a bit when we read the prompt, for that he looked not upon her. I have a speaker, seems to be perhaps the he here, and his direct audience, which might be her. But again, this is all speculation. I have not read this poem. I also noticed that the syntax and the wording here might be unconventional, or perhaps it was conventional in the 16th century, but I have to prepare myself for, for some of this inversion that I might encounter throughout the poem. Once you read the title and you think about the title for a little bit, I think it's important for us to just look at the poem, observe it. I notice some footnotes, which will help me with some of the vocabulary here. I notice the lines. I notice that there are 14 lines. And as soon as I see 14 lines in a poem, I have to ask myself a question. Are we dealing with a sonnet? Now, not all 14 line poems are sonnets, but pretty much all sonnets are 14 lines. There are some exceptions, I know. But why should I care about whether this is a sonnet or not? Well, with the structure in mind, I can be helped in my reading. And let me show you what I mean by this. If I look at the rhyme scheme and I connect strange and range and low and grow, I realize that we do have an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G rhyme scheme. And if you've studied sonnets before, if you've reviewed the sonnets in your classes, you'll recognize this as a Shakespearean sonnet or an English sonnet. Now you don't get any points for this, right? No aspect of the rubric will reward me for simply identifying the type of poem or the type of sonnet. But I haven't even read this poem, and this bit of information can already help me because I remember that many times Shakespearean sonnets are organized with three quatrains followed by a heroic couplet. This is valuable information. See, reading 14 lines of a poem is, is too difficult. It's very difficult to keep these 14 lines in mind, figure out how they're working against each other. It's much easier for me to tackle four lines at a time and then try to see the interaction between these three quatrains before they converge onto what's usually the, the synthesis or the conclusion or the resolution, which we find in the heroic couplet. Now I'm ready to read because now I'm ready to read not just 14 lines, but I'm prepared to read a poem that has been chunked or clustered into quatrain units. So I'm able to process those much more efficiently. Before you read, however, I want you to keep the prompt in mind. We never wanna read with no task in mind. Because it's almost a waste of our time to read at that point because we're gonna read the poem and then go back to the prompt and then wanna reread the poem. No, I wanna remind myself right now that as I read this poem, I'm gonna be thinking about the complex attitude of the speaker. So I'm gonna, I want you to pause the video right now, read carefully, take some time to read this poem and then come back and join me. Okay, if you're back, you've unpaused the video, you have read this poem, and you might have a question about what we mean by complex attitude.
By the way, let me give you some insider information. Always, always focus on the complexity, right? Even if the prompt weren't to include the word complex, which it, it, it undoubtedly will, you always have to treat it as if there is a complex attitude, a complex relationship, a complex response, because no one is looking for a single word answer. In fact, for all of these prompts, and I think it's very liberating, there isn't a single right answer. There's a broad spectrum of interpretation. So what do we mean by this, by this complexity? Are we looking for contradictory feelings? Are we looking for antonyms, if you will? Well, that's not, that's not necessarily the case. Now, you might find that at times, but not always. Are we looking for synonyms? Well, the answer to that is a very clear and resounding no. If you say that someone is sad, and then you follow it up with the person is depressed or gloomy, you're not really building the argument. You're not providing a different aspect. You're not adding to the nuance of our understanding. You're simply giving us another word that means the same thing. And we're also not focused on sophisticated vocabulary. We're not looking for students to give us, you know, that, that high brow word. If the person is sad, you can say sad. You don't have to go to morose or, or anything else that you think will impress us. So then what do we mean by complexity if it's not these things? My understanding of complexity is that there is a layering or a buildup, a, a compilation of different attitudes. Some of these may be contradictory, but not necessarily. The objective is to start seeing the characters of stories, the speakers of poems as people. If you were to describe me, yourselves, a, a relative, you probably couldn't do it in a single word. It requires a lot of adjectives for us to get a, a thorough understanding of that person. So that's exactly what I want us to do here. So as we read this poem, we might get different impressions about the attitude of the speaker. We might think that the speaker is pained or cautious or loving. And there's certainly textual evidence to support each of these things. But I don't want you to think that these are the right answers or that these are the only answers. I think the most interesting triangle here is the one in the bottom right. What is it that you can offer as you read this poem? How do you think Gascoigne uses literary elements and techniques to convey the complex attitude of the speaker? How is the speaker feeling about the lady, about love, about his predicament, about life itself? We're on our way now to answering this question. We've already read the poem. We've already thought about this complexity of the speaker and all these different aspects that make up the speaker. But a series of adjectives don't create an essay. So what is it that we build our response on? Well, we have to, and I, I love graphic organizers because it helps us to organize our thoughts. And it also organizes our essays for us. And you could jot this down somewhere, you know, on a scrap sheet of paper. And you might want to create this little chart very quickly. You have the adjectives for the attitude that you have come up with. Now we're looking for textual evidence. What is it in the poem that led me to believe that this attitude of the speaker is a pained attitude or a cautious attitude? And we're going to look for quotations. Remember, those bullet points in the beginning. We are looking for textual evidence and then your commentary on that textual evidence. Once you build this catalog of textual evidence, I want you to look at the language that was used in the creation of those words, of those phrases, of those lines. Are there literary elements and techniques at play? And I guarantee you that there will be. You're going to find imagery. You're going to find metaphor. You're going to find alliteration. You're going to find all sorts of poetic elements and techniques that contribute to the creation of the language, that contribute to our understanding, our perception of the speaker's attitude. Whenever we answer these poetry questions, I want you to keep a few things in mind. Notice that I did not go directly into the poem. I spent some time with the prompt. I read it carefully. I extrapolated information. 
And then I still didn't read the poem. Then I looked at the poem. I tried to look at the structure of the poem. You know, different things might come up. Uh, the indentations, the spacing, the rhyme scheme. All these things will then be used to filter our reading to try to see how it is that the poet used the structure in order to convey the attitude or the meaning of the poem. And then we thought about literary elements and techniques, which I didn't delve into for this video because we're actually gonna focus on that next time I see you. I hope that this guidance provides some support, some scaffold for you to be able to answer this question. And I look forward to seeing you for the next video.